Welcome to Concordia Theological Seminary and to our podcasts on the Gospels. Uh, we will be talking today uh, about one of the texts for Reformation, which is Matthew chapter 11, verses 12 through 19. And um, in some sense, of course, it's a short text, but it's also profound and uh, and maybe uh, it really is one that also, I think, hits home for us, especially when we look out at the scene of American Christianity today. And um, our Lord is very reflective here. Um, he's thinking about the ministry of both uh, John the Baptist as well as his own ministry. And he's thinking about the kind of reception that he has received. And it is a great wonder that when our Lord came that more people did not come to the faith. In one sense, he drew to him many people, and yet, in another sense, remarkably, so many rejected him and rejected his message, um, even though he did great miracles among them, even though he showed himself to be God's son, and he came uh, with healing and forgiveness and a message of hope. And sometimes we might feel that way, too, as, as pastors. How is it that um, the gospel does not have the same impact upon the world uh, as it seems, uh, as it has among us? And we think about um, why that is. Well, our Lord says, um, from the days of John the Baptist, so he's thinking about John the Baptist there, um, until... Uh, the kingdom of the the heavens. So, uh, and from from the beginning of the days of John the Baptist until until now, um, sorry, until recently, the uh, kingdom of the heavens is is taken by by force, and uh, strong people seize it. Now, this has been a matter of some debate, and I go back and forth on this, what does this mean? Um, some people say, well, this is uh, people who heroically in faith grab hold of the faith and of the kingdom in a good way. Uh, when you think of John the Baptist, what he had to deal with, he came up against uh, a strong man, I guess in a sense, in Herod, and against violent opposition. Um, so it is that the kingdom of the heavens is always in opposition or will be opposed by the kingdom of this world. And we saw that, for instance, in the children of Israel as they met the, the strength of the Pharaoh who enslaved them and put their baby boys to death. Uh, we saw this in the, the evil kings of the Old Testament. And we saw that also in the story of the, of the, king, the, the king of the political Israel, King Herod, as he sought to kill the baby Jesus. <coughs> now, um, so the kingdom of the heavens is always taken by force, and then strong men, well, they try to seize it. And this is the way it's always been. For which prophets? For all of the prophets and the law until John the Baptist. That's what they prophesied. Now, why is this, by the way, one of the Reformation texts? Because I suppose um, this, this is a great uh, model for the ministry of Martin Luther himself. Because Martin Luther was, um, as he proclaimed his gospel, did so against great opposition. In one sense, you could say he spoke up against the corruption and the false teaching of the church, which is true. But at that time, of course, the church was... Uh, uh, and, the, and the state were so wrapped up together that um, he was truly fighting against uh, political opposition, religious opposition. He was fighting against the kingdoms of this world. <coughs> now, this is, this is what all of the prophets, and we know what happens to prophets. They're put to death in Jerusalem. We know what happened to John the Baptist for his prophecy. He lost his head. 
Now, I love the way Jesus talks here because he, he realizes he's introducing a kind of strange concept, but um, it, it's, it's really remarkable to think about. If you are able to re receive it, I mean, this is going to seem strange to you, um, but who is this? That is, who is John the Baptist? Well, he in fact is Elijah. Now this is important for you know a, a lot when it comes to biblical interpretation, because um, it, as we as we look at the Old Testament figures, they are figures in and of themselves. They are real people, and yet in a way also they are offices or types. So that uh, we can say this about Jesus: Jesus is the new Moses. Jesus is the son of David. Jesus is the greater Solomon. Jesus is the Joshua who leads us you know, over the river. He is the new Adam in whom all of uh, mankind now subsists. Um, now, this is not simply true for Jesus here, but it's also true for John the Baptist. He is the Elijah, the one who was going, who was going to, to come. So John the Baptist is the Elijah. And we know the kind of opposition that Elijah had to face um, with Jezebel and on the Mount of Mount Carmel. Um, so we've seen this act before. That is to say, John the Baptist is wearing clothes like Elijah, and um, he's preaching a message of repentance like Elijah, and he will also face the same opposition as did Elijah. And uh, so J Jesus says, He who has ears to this, uh, third person, uh, we call it an imperative, let him, well, here, adjustive, we say in Latin, let him hear. Um, so, if you have ears to hear, let the person who has ears to hear, let them hear. And um, it, now this is the part that I really, I really love, because Jesus is looking out at the people, and it's not as if, right, they're, they're evil, they're not, um, not in that sense. They're, they're fickle. Um, they don't take things perhaps uh, seriously. Um, in a sense, they don't have ears to hear because uh, they belittle everything. And I think, boy, that sounds like our generation. What then shall I liken to what shall I liken this generation? And I suppose this generation, in a sense, is, is every generation. And certainly we feel it today. Well, what's it like? Well, it's like children, paideos. It's homoi, homoia. It is like uh, children, likened to children. What are they doing? They're just sitting around. Cafe menois. They're sitting around in the agora, in the, in the marketplace. They're just, whatever it is, in the old days, I suppose they'd be playing jacks or dice. They are hanging around. And what are they doing? Um, I guess they're, in a way they're loitering in a way. But they're, they're pros von unta. They're calling to uh, one another. And uh, so they're just going back and forth with idle talk, not doing uh, much of anything. And then Jesus says, uh, verse 17, yes, um, I, I, love, I love this phrase. It's one of my favorites in all of the scriptures. It says, we played the flute for you, and what? You didn't dance. So, you know, we played a happy song, and you weren't happy about it. You didn't get up and dance. You're just, you're just sitting there like slugs, and it doesn't mean anything to you. And then... The other part is, <coughs> we uh, we sang a dirge. That's the we we a sad, a sad song. So we sang a a sad song, and you did not ekot pasad. You didn't tear your garments apart. You didn't mourn. And what Jesus is saying is, what more could we have done for you people? I mean, in the one sense, this encapsulates the ministries 
of John the Baptist and of Jesus. We could say they both had the same essential message. Repent, for the kingdom of the heavens is at hand. In another sense, their two ministries kind of embodied these two, two songs. So that John the Baptist, he came, as we see, um, and this is the way, this is uh, what Jesus will then say. For John the Baptist came neither um, eating or drinking. <coughs> and they say he has a demon. Well, what does that mean? Uh, we know he ate locusts and wild honey. But he wasn't at the banquets. Of course, he ate for, he ate for uh, nutrition to keep his body going. But he wasn't going out for fine dining. He wasn't at the banquet. He wasn't at the buffet. He wasn't at the wedding banquet. And of course, he drank water, but he drank no strong drink. He was, I guess, a teetotaler. So he's not part of the party. In that sense, he reminds me, I suppose, of, of Jeremiah. And our Lord said to Jeremiah, you may not neither go, you may not attend a wedding, for instance, or a funeral, because the problem was with the people. They were so involved in their ordinary life, in the enjoyment of life, that they gave no thought to the life to come. So John the Baptist said, you know, eating and drinking, I mean, how much of our lives do we talk about, oh, have you tried this new restaurant? Have you tried this new recipe? Or, oh, let's go to the bar. And again, it's not, that talk, not talking about drunkenness here at all, talking about simply, um, you know, the kind of things you look forward to, tailgating at a, at a football game. Let's go out together and have a beer and watch the game, the kind of joys of life. Well, John the Baptist, he didn't do any of that. He didn't eat and he didn't drink. He didn't feast. He wasn't at the party. He wasn't the life of the party. He wasn't even at the party. And what do they say? He wears this, you know, the proverbial sackcloth and ashes. He's, and they say, oh, he's got a demon. Look how strange he is. What an oddball he is. So they dismiss him. Okay, so well. What about the Son of Man? That's the way Jesus talks about himself in his humility. He says, what about the Son of Man? <coughs> well, he came eating and drinking. So, yeah, Jesus ate and drank with tax collectors and sinners. Luke tells us ate and drank. Um, he made wine for the wedding at Cana. That He, he was no, no teetotaler. If he was invited to a feast, he went to the feast. He was with the people. And again, there's a part of this in our life. Um, pastors experience this. There is a time for fasting and a time for feasting. Um, in fasting, we're saying the world does not matter. We're saying, what is the world to me with all its pleasures? Nothing. When we feast, we're saying that the Lord has given us all of these great gifts. And we join right in there with the people. And there's a place for both. Well, it says the Son of Man was, in fact, eating and drinking. How many times do we see him sitting at table um, with others, with his disciples, with the Pharisees, with the tax collectors and sinners? And what does that get him? Well, they say, behold, this man is a glutton and a drunkard. So, you know, you can't win with the world, with the unbelieving world. So you can live your monastic life, I suppose, or ascetic life, and avoid all the pleasures as a way of saying, people, you know, this world isn't all that there is. There is a world to come. And the people say, oh, that guy's crazy. What is he doing? And then you can come and you can participate, and you can eat and drink, and still, what do you get for it? They just say, oh, look at him. He's a glutton. He's a drunkard. Of course, he wasn't either. I mean, Jesus was not a fat man, <laughs> and he wasn't ever a drunkard. That wasn't the point. But that's the kind of accusations that Jesus met with, because ultimately, you know, it's not about the eating and drinking. Whether you eat and drink or don't eat and don't drink, do it all towards the glory of God. And what Jesus is reflecting on is the fact that, you know, the real problem is that people don't want the message. It's like, what more could I, what more could I do for you? 
And of course, Luther, when we think about the Reformation, he had all sorts of detractors, people who didn't like him for this and didn't like him for that. And the real reason why they didn't like him was because he spoke the gospel truth that they didn't want to hear. <coughs> now, this is ironic, I suppose. They, they criticized Jesus as being a, again, here this Phyllis, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And, of course, that is right. He was a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And I guess we should say thank God for that because um, what is meant to be an accusation against Jesus is actually a great gospel hope. Because when we see that Jesus eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners, then we're reminded that he invites us to his feast. And he invites sinners like us to come and dine with him at the heavenly feast, at the Holy Communion, which is where we as sinners there receive his body and blood for his forgiveness, and we are in communion with the one who loves us. Now this last phrase is a little bit enigmatic, but also wonderful. For Sophia, but just Sophia wisdom is justified by her deeds. Now, what exactly does this mean? Um, in some ways, Jesus is saying, everything does come out in the wash. You will know a tree by its fruit. And um, so in some ways, I suppose here, this is Jesus at his philosophical best. He's recognizing that the world, you know, the word they still shall let remain, nor any thanks have for it. That's the great Reformation hymn. And that's what Luther understands about um, as he rediscovers in a way, not that it was ever completely lost, anything like that, but as he uh, puts forth the power of the word Luther did, he recognizes that the world will still have, have, have no thanks for it, will not in gratitude receive it, though some, in fact, will be saved. So what do you do? In the end, you keep doing what you're doing. You keep preaching the gospel, because in the end, it will be justified. And justified here means, um, justified means, like in a court of law, in the end, it will come out. The evidence will be shown, to, and what you do will be shown to be true. And this is building up on what Jesus had said in the previous chapter. What you whisper, what you hear whispered in your ears, shout on the rooftops. There's nothing that is hidden that will not one day be made known. So forget about the opinions of the people, because the opinions of the people will always be against the gospel. Whether, again, whether you don't eat or drink, they'll say you're crazy. Whether you eat or drink, if you're sitting, stop. But if, if that's not the point, though, if people are, they're going to criticize you, I guarantee you, simply because you preach the gospel, and they'll find a way. But in the end, the wisdom, which is the wisdom that has been hidden and is now revealed in Christ, it will be justified, it will be made known for all to see, and so uh, wisdom is justified by her, her deeds. So keep at it, um, keep doing what you're doing, never lose uh, Never lose faith or hope. Be persistent in the preaching of the gospel and in the doing of good. And um, we say we are saved by grace, but our good works do follow us. And that is true from Revelation. What you do for the sake of the gospel will not be forgotten, and it will be uh, to the glory of God and to our eternal thanksgiving as well. So thank you for being with us during this uh, podcast, and we look forward to uh, many to come. Thank you.